evening everybody and good evening uh, our esteemed friends from thailand and of course Hello. our speakers uh, and especially sriram who is of course uh, uh, well known to this crowd but uh, i my special thanks to him for not only joining this but also there's another thing that i want to thank him for he has created this large discussion by his latest publication and that's going to really bring out some more knowledge and that's that's very important so those who have not read that please go on to phlebology and so on so forth and anyway we'll i'll just uh, start the uh, proceedings uh, or the talk for today and uh, come all uh, this is uh, uh, i would like you to um, uh, introduce your uh, thai speakers of course uh, i i introduce sriram in in a, in a way that uh, is uh, i think uh, more appropriate but he is he is at the at the hardy street uh, vein i mean the parts of that deals with the vein but the hardy street clinic in singapore and of course has uh, been uh, previously in uk and now in singapore and doing wonderful work with deep vein pathology and how to manage it so uh, come full please please go ahead uh -huh. uh, good evening everybody i'm going to introduce uh, the team of that from thailand I'm a Dr. Kampon. Uh, I'm a president of Thai Thai Venus Forum, and uh, my colleagues are Dr. Nathwood from Sirira Hospital, Dr. Vichai from uh, uh, Wachira Hospital, and our speaker, uh, Dr. Kanin from Sirira Hospital. Thank you. Finish. Thank you. And so now let's uh, start on with the uh, panelists uh, from both sides, and uh, if the panelists can now take over and uh, uh, just introduce themselves. Rahul um, uh, is our uh, panelist uh, from India, and uh, he is the immediate past president of the Venus Association of India. He's um the director of vascular surgery at the ortis hospital in mohali and uh, dr notawat of course we know but he was introduced very well by kampol so let's make the beginning and let's have the first speaker so kampol is that is that okay yeah we just go ahead yeah, yeah. First speaker, yeah. Right? absolutely so absolutely. so we can uh, request uh, dr kanin uh, to share his screen and uh, you can start with your talk, please. All right, can you see my screen, sir? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's a great honor to collaborate in this international meeting and hopefully in the future, we will have this kind of meeting again. My topic today is the evaluation of ileo cable obstruction in advanced chronic venous insufficiency. I have no disclosure. As you have already known, the ileo cable venous obstruction can lead to severe form of the chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, the disease can be post thrombotic after the patient developed the DVT or it could be the external compression from the structure, and we call it non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions or navel. And those patients would benefit from heat treatment by venous stenting. And in generally, the luminal narrowing of more than 50% is considered significant stenosis. But we have to take into account that not all of the patients has symptoms. If the patient is completely asymptomatic, we don't have to do anything with the patient. But in case of the patient with the chronic venous disease, uh, if we see the prevalence reported in the large cohort by Professor Raju, we find the high incidence of 21% of the more than 50% stenosis and half of them the nibble. So I would say the goal for evaluation of the ileo cable obstruction is first to identify 
which leads in its significant stenosis. And secondly, we have to determine the extent of the disease because we have to cover on the, all the lesion when we perform the venous stenting for the better result. For my scope of talk today, I would talk about the preoperative imaging of choice and also the intraoperative imaging. And hopefully if time allowed, I will share with you my experience. So we start with the preoperative imaging. Uh, I would include the duplex ultrasonography and the CTV. As we have already known, uh, when we use the duplex ultrasonography to directly visualize the iliac vein or the IVC, it's quite technically difficult due to the bowel gas and due to the big abdominal wall. So often, very often, we rely on the indirect evidences, such as the loss of the femoral respiratory variation or the reverse flow in the superficial epigastric vein. As you can see in the picture, here is the normal physiology of the basic flow in the common femoral vein, and this should be equal bilaterally. In the patient with the iliohebral obstruction, we can see the loss of respiratory variation in the common femoral vein. And this is very interesting, the superficial epigastric vein, the normal physiology drains into the common femoral vein downward to the body. But in case the patient has, has the iliocable obstruction, this vein can act as the collateral vein draining the blood upward that we can detect by the duplex ultrasonography. This has been reported before in 16 cases in Ohio and all of the patient have the iliocable obstruction. So uh, in our team of research led by Dr. Natwood, we study about the prevalence, the risk factor, and the evaluation of the iliocable obstruction in the advanced CVI patient. The objective is to determine the prevalence of the iliocable obstruction in CVI patient, and also to identify the risk factor and to evaluate the accuracy of the duplex ultrasonography for both of the respiratory variation and the reverse flow in the super, superficial epigastric vein. We, decide, we decided the prospective study, and here is the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So uh, every patient who came to our clinic, we collect all the data, and every patient underwent the venous duplex, duplex ultrasonography compared to the CTV. And here's how we measure the stenosis. We measure the smallest diameter of the iliac vein compared to the normal vein, or if the entire segment is stenosed, we compare it to the contralateral side. And we managed to include 106 patients with 135 limbs. And here's the prevalence we, we found the prevalence of 28.1%, which could be in the ICDO alone or combined with the superficial or deep end reflux. And the independent risk factor for ICDO is the left leg and the previous history of the DVT. And what about the duplex? The loss of the femoral respiratory variation, we found that the sensitivity is not so great at 23% but the specificity and the positive predictive value is very high at 100%. And similarly to the reverse flow in the superficial epigastric vein, the sensitivity is not too good at around 8%, but also the positive predictive value for the iliocable obstruction is 100%. So we propose the possible clinical application in uh, if we perform the duplex and we See the abnormality, we might skip the CTV and send the patient straight to the theater. Right, and what about the intraoperative imaging? I would talk about the standard venography and also the intravenous ultrasonography or the IBUS. As it's been reported before, venography when compared to the IVAS has 
poor sensitivity and we can miss a lot of lesion and also can underestimate the stenosis and also uh, can miss the landing zone, especially the landing zone and also the uh, distal landing zone and the confluence as much as one vertebral body. And the report by Professor Paul Kaj uh, with the IWAS combined with the venography alone, 57% of the patient changed the treatment plan by the IWAS, either by identifying more lesions or determine the more severe extension of the disease to determine the landing zone of the stent. Which lesion should be treated? Normally more than 50% is considered significant. And this was collaborated by the analysis from the video trial that said it depend on how you measure the stenosis either by the diameter or the area. And it found that uh, the degree of the stenosis around 52% to 56% is considered significant that the patient would benefit from the venous stenting. And this is the recommended stent diameter and the post-stent IBUS area. In the common iliac vein, I would recommend the 16 to 18 millimeter with the area of at least 200 square millimeters. And in external iliac vein, 14 and 100 square millimeters and common femoral vein, 12 and 110. So I have a little bit of time, so I would share a little bit of my experience. The first case is a Thai male, 70, 74 year old, without the previous history of the DVT. Uh, the patient had the non healing venous ulcer for three years despite the compression therapy and the medication. The duplex ultrasound showed the normal femoral respiratory variation, but uh, deep vein reflux is detected and it's the Kistner for reflux by descending venography. And here is the CTV of the patient. As you can see, I will, from the IVC and you can see, we don't quite see the stenosis of the iliac vein. And here's the venography. As you can see, it's almost completely normal. But from the IVAS on the right side, And after the confluence, you can start to see the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery has a pressure effect to the iliac veins and causing the long segment of the luminal narrowing. As you can see clearly here. So in this case, uh, it's a Mayferner syndrome, but it's in the right side. So I decided to put the stent in and here is the stent and you can see there is no compression anymore. And here's the result. The wound completely healing in approximately three months and the patient has the more than one year follow up now. And the patient still anticoagulated but the uh, also is here is no recurrent. And also the deep vein reflux from the duplex ultrasound is disappeared. I suspect it's from the better drainage of the venous system. So the deep vein valve become function again. And the second case I would like to share is a 61 Thai year old male. And as you can see in the picture, it's a very severe chronic venous insufficiency with non-healing ulcer. And in this case, there is no respiratory variation with poor augmentation from the duplex. And here is the duplex ultrasound, yeah, the CTV, as you can see. The common iliac vein is quite, quite okay, but the external iliac vein is stenosis, and there is a lot of the collateral vein. And this is the venography. You can see that the complete obliteration of the external iliac vein and the collateral draining from the internal iliac vein up to the IVC. And the common electron looks fine 
here. But for the IVs, I would say this is on the left side, we start from the IVC. And after the confluence, you will start to see the artery in around 10 o'clock. And there is also the compression of the left, com left common iliac pain by the common iliac artery and the bone. So this lesion we can easily miss with the venography alone. And on the right side, as you can see, the fibrotic wall with the thickening and the webbing of the external iliac vein. So in this case, I decided to stain from the confluence to cover all the lesion. And here is the patient leg starting to get better and eventually the wound heal. And now it's more than one year without the recurrence. So I would like to conclude my talk here today uh, that the prevalence of the iliocable obstruction is high among patients with advanced chronic venous insufficiency who would benefit from venous stenting. The duplex ultrasonography is not sensitive for the diagnosis, but very specific if you find the positive duplex. You might skip the CTV and send the patient directly to the theater. And the venography is not good enough, so always use the IVERS to identify the lesions and to determine the landing zone for the stenting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kanin, for that wonderful presentation. Yes, that's that's the whole key. And as I, if I may borrow Sriram's words, you know, there are three things that you need to diagnose this, the, the deep vein stenotic lesion or the, uh, uh, you know, outside compression on the vein from wherever it comes or the variants of the May Turner. And he, he says three words, I was, I was an I was. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. He, <laughs> he said there are exactly three things that you should do. And uh, I, I cannot, uh, you know, uh, debate that in any way except that um, I may just ask a question is that there are so many places where I was is not yet prevalent. And is there any way on the angiogram, on, on the venogram? like a lateral view or this view or an upside down view or whatever you want to, that can probably help you. Is there anything in there that you can do? Uh, yes, in my opinion, it might be better to, if the IVAS is not available, maybe we can use more than one view of the venogram. Maybe you can perform the LAO or RAO, but from my experience from my center, before we have the IVAS around a year ago, the result of the venography and standing is not so good. We have a lot oh, of thrombosis. Oh, even I, I, when we I, perform the oh, I, I, I don't debate that. You know, I, I mean, nobody can argue with that. So um, we, we now move on to Sriram and I, I, I uh, you know, ask uh, Sriram to answer that question at the end of his talk too, because you know, to be honest, many, many centers who see these cases do not have IVAS. And that's the whole problem, you know, for yeah. the increase. And, and you know, then, then you start seeing studies here and there which say that they, this is being overdiagnosed, overstented, and all this. And it's getting a little bad name in that sense, which is not true or which is not correct. So that's, that's what we want to try and... Uh, uh, focus on. So please, Sriram. Uh, the you, is you want me to take that now or shall I finish my talk and do well, it? Well, you, you, you can take it now or you can take it later because I'm uh, sure that you're going to re-emphasize and stress this point during uh, your talk and after your talk. Uh, so, well, yes, uh, I'll take it out at the end of it. We'll do the discussion yeah, at the end. I think that, that would because, be... Because uh, there are some things in the, in the answer that will be covered in the presentation itself. So Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Wonderful. So, Please, please. Okay, so I'll share my screen now. Yes, please. 
can everybody mute their mics please vishal can you just mute yeah accept the speaker yes sir All right uh, thank you very much both the venus association of india and uh, the thai vascular association the thai venus forum and can in wonderful talk thank you very much i have a lot of comments on it actually that will probably go on for a while um but uh, i'm i'm going to go through uh, my talk today which is on a protocol based and ivis guided algorithm for pelvic congestion syndrome um since there is a fair amount of overlap in this um with your uh, wonderful talk so the first question i want to ask is uh, or throw open to the audience is why do you need a protocol uh why does anybody need a protocol uh if you're going to look after a uh, pelvic congestion syndrome two reasons firstly among the gynecologists um as well as the lay public um there is a group of believers which are very few and there's a group of non believers who think that pelvic congestion syndrome as a vascular problem doesn't really exist um that it's all in the woman's head um and that women have to learn to live with it uh so they don't look at it as a real disease many of them um the second problem of course is that there is a huge symptom overlap between what pelvic congestion syndrome uh, produces and between what a lot of uh other gynecological conditions produce so the standard symptoms of a pcs would be a chronic pelvic pain usually about lasting more than 6 months there would be lumbar discomfort that's pain associated with the period um there's painful intercourse and urinary frequency there can also be some bowel symptoms varicose veins in the vulva or perineal or gluteal regions uh and these are fairly common Uh, so to say that it's pcs and uh, not uh, uh, some other gynecological condition uh, means that you need to have some way of determining the exact diagnosis and that's why you need a protocol uh the other problem of course is that you need to develop now uh, uh, some degree of both the public as well as physician confidence in both the diagnosis and our approach to the treatment um because on the one hand you have a lot of other physician colleagues not just vascular but in in other specialties who uh have a lack of knowledge about NIVLs and pelvic reflux and pelvic escape points and um the connection between the pelvic and the um lower limb veins so they don't have that knowledge it was never taught in medical school because it never existed at the time uh there's a public perception that uh, you know painful periods are part of a woman's life and there's some degree of insecurity when you start talking about putting implants in these patients and of course the whole picture is even further spoiled by unscrupulous interventionists um who see a bit of pain and decide that this is the time to put in an implant um and make um a little bit of cash um so if you don't have a clear protocol on how to approach it it will be very difficult for us to raise the confidence in both the public as well as the patients at large of course pelvic congestion syndrome's name should be changed and is being changed to pelvic venous hypertension or pelvic venous pathology or pelvic venous disorder uh, and 10 to 15% of women will be affected uh, with these uh, symptoms uh, 10% of them are hyperestrogenic uh, from multiple pregnancies or a hyperestrogenic state uh, but 90% of them are secondary to a venous outflow obstruction which could be an NIVL a non thrombotic iliac vein lesion it could be a retroaortic left renal vein uh, and it could be a nutcracker mechanism where the renal vein is caught in the aortomesenteric angle Uh so by and large PCS is about raised upstream pressures uh, because either uh, you have a block in the region uh, of the left renal vein going backwards into the ovarian or you have a black uh, block in the region of the common iliac vein uh, with pressure being transmitted down uh, the internal iliac vein either way uh, this axis is in complete communication with itself so there is a renal gonadal uh, pelvic venous axis and an internal iliac vein Uh, reflux can lead to an ovarian vein dilatation and an ovarian venous reflux can lead to an iliac vein dilatation so the problem is how do you actually identify does this patient need an ovarian vein embolization as the primary intervention does this patient need an iliac vein stenting as the primary intervention or does this patient need both or does this patient need neither 
So if you don't have a stepwise algorithm, you're going to end up doing the wrong thing for the wrong patient sooner or later. And remember, nutcracker is not just about eotomesenteric compression of the left renal vein. You can have pancreatic neoplasms, uh, lymphadenopathies, aneurysms rarely, retroperitoneal fibrosis, left-sided IVC type, uh, and to left SVC with the hemizygous continuation. So these anatomical variations can also give you a nutcracker-like phenomenon with the dilated left ovarian vein. So the first step in this algorithm is take your history and stages. Suspect a pelvic congestion syndrome if you see, of course, with symptoms, extra truncal varicosities. Varicosities in the posterior thigh, which are gluteal escape, varicosities on the lateral aspect of the leg, uh, which could be from various types of pelvic escape, varicosities in the vulva, and varicosities in the groin, so inguinal uh, and uh, perineal point escape. Be prepared to take the consultation of your post-coital or coital pain without a partner around. Most patients will not confess that sex is painful when they have their partner around. Uh, but they will let you know about that when the partner is not there. But that brings in a legal issue. So if you're examining or speaking to a woman about her sex life, make sure there is a chaperone around uh, who's female. Do not have that conversation uh, by yourself if you don't want a legal problem. Remember always that there is a symptomatology uh, overlap between other gynecological conditions, commonest being endometriosis and fibroids, of course. And so the previous gynecological history does take some prompting. Uh, you have to ask them, have they had laparoscopies? Have they had Mirena coils in the past? Have they had Depo-Progesterone in the past? Uh, what have they done during their post-pubital time for their pelvic pain? Uh, so take your time taking this history. Do not rush this, and you might have to see the patient twice or thrice before all of it comes out. So in teasing out the history, remember this. What is written in red on the right is really uh, typical of pelvic congestion. Lower back, coccygeal, and positional pain. That is typical of pelvic congestion. So if they lie flat and the pain is bad, and then they have to curl up on their left side or right side with a hot water bottle and change the drainage position, and if that improves the pain, it is more likely to be PCS. The painful period is not just a painful period. Period should be painful, uh, usually the day just before the period, the first day and the second day of the period. And you might even get a history of them passing clots with some stringy material. That is typical of a congestive dysmenorrhea. That is PCS. The pain on coitus is not usually coital pain. There are a lot of local conditions, uh, you know, both in follicles, um, with age you can have uh, trauma, you can have all sorts of uh, ulceration and lesions that will cause pain during intercourse. The typical history is post-coital pain. Pain should be there after intercourse, which can last one to six hours even, um, and that is a typical history. Be careful about the urinary frequency and about hematuria. Light hematuria can occur during a period or it looks like hematuria, but intermenstrual, intermenstrual hematuria, that is something to investigate uh, because it can, of course, be a, 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 a renal or a urological lesion, but it can also mean that there are periureteric varices that are causing bleed and therefore the PCS is bad. The next step I take is the PCS score, the pelvic congestion syndrome score. The reason why we do the score is if the score is less than three, we do not proceed to a transvaginal duplex. It's very unlikely to be a PCS. The score is administered to women who have chronic pain for more than six months, pelvic pain. Uh, and if it is negative, you don't have to go ahead with the duplex. You can do CTs and look for other things. Uh, but if it is positive, then we go ahead with the duplex. And why do we do a transabdominal, transvaginal duplex? Why do we score before that? It is a duplex. It is supposed to be non-invasive, but there is nothing in non-invasive about a transvaginal duplex. It is emotionally and physically invasive, even though it is ultrasound. Uh, so please be sure of that. And these are the six questions in the PCS score, and it's a yes or no um, answer. And you will find that the question number four is usually best answered when the partner is not around. Um, they do not like to say yes to question four when the partner is around. So if you have a score of five or six, you're almost certain you have a proper PCS. And if it's three with chronic pain or four, five or six, they will go ahead 
uh, with the transabdominal transvaginal duplex. So that's step two in the algorithm, do the PCS score. Step three, it's an A and B because step three A is the transvaginal, step three B is the transabdominal. Why do we do a transvaginal uh, ultrasound scan? You are looking to see if there are pelvic varices, if there actually are pelvic varices, and are there incompetent veins? And I'll tell you what the incompetent vein criteria is in the pelvis in a minute. But you should also need to rule out other gynecological pathology because you don't want to be get you don't want to be caught out. You will see pelvic adhesions, you will see adenomyosis and fibroids. Endometriosis is difficult to see uh, on a trans uh, vaginal ultrasound, and you will assess for involvement of the bladder and rectum. If the patient complains of a lot of postcoital pain and you don't see paravaginal varices, it is likely to be something else. You, otherwise, you will see the paravaginal varices. And you have to be, uh, you have to prepare them for it. Yeah, there's six hours of fasting because of the abdominal scan. Otherwise, you'll only see the food that they've eaten before. And they need to drink water because the first part of the scan uh, is done, um, the abdominal part is done with the bladder full. Uh, and the vaginal part is then done with the bladder empty. So they drink water, get the abdominal bit done, then they go, they pass urine, they come back, and then they get the vaginal part done. So there's some preparation required. And these are the diagnostic criteria. Really. You're looking for pelvic varices, adnexal, paracervical, paravaginal, and internal iliac-related varices that are greater than four millimeters in size. You're looking for slow venous flow in those pelvic varices at less than three centimeters per second. And this ultrasound picture uh, on the right, which is one of the patients who are, we are going to talk about, um, uh, shows uh, all of these characteristics. The venous reflux will be demonstrated on a Valsalva. You can see internal retrograde flow down the internal iliac vein, and you will see dilated arc with veins crossing the myometrium, and I will show that to you. We also then, in our transvaginal scan, do a standard VAFI, a veno-arteriolar flow index. I will discuss this index in more detail when I'm answering the question because it sort of covers um, some aspects of the NIVL as well, because we are looking for the NIVL. Uh, but essentially, uh, it is uh, the venous out outflow from the limb in one minute at the femoral vein divided by the arterial inflow uh, in one minute uh, at the femoral artery. Logically, if one liter of blood goes down the artery in one minute, the one liter of blood should come out of the femoral vein in that minute. However, if you get less than one liter coming out, then there is likely to be an outflow obstruction in the iliac tract. Um, we're just about to publish the third in our series of these uh, uh, Guytonian papers uh, with over 300 WAFIs assessed. And um, a normal WAFI is 1 to 1.2. Uh, if the WAFI is less than 0 0.7, which means only 70% of the blood flow is coming out of the femoral vein, uh, the chances of finding a lesion of the IVUS uh, on IVUS are almost 100%. Uh, you, uh, so that has become our criteria for assessment now, but I will go over it um, uh, later uh, during the answers. So this is what we're looking for. We are looking for loss of phasicity in the internal iliac waveform. We are looking for reversal of flow in the internal iliac vein. And we are looking for a low VAFI to tell us uh, whether an NIVL is present. So these are very large volume varices on a transvaginal duplex in one of the patients uh, that we are going to look at uh, shortly. Uh, and this you can see here, the uterus uh, is right in the center of the picture. And at the bottom, right across like a ring running like that uh, is the myometrial arcade. Uh, this, uh, these are dilated varices running right across the uterine myometrium, uh, and they pretty much are diagnostic of an ovarian venous reflux. Uh, it does not occur uh, in an internal iliac reflux, and I'll show that to you. Um, so the second part of it uh, is a transabdominal ultrasound, uh, and what you're really looking for is the size and the reflux in the left ovarian vein. You may be able to pick up the nutcracker in many cases as well, and you can examine the internal iliac vein in more detail. The WAFI is done when the patient is having their transabdominal bit done, so they're lying flat for the transabdominal ultrasound. And the WAFI is also done in the supine position, so you finish the abdominal scan, then do the WAFI, and then you do the transvaginal part of the scan. So this is what we are looking for to investigate the cause of the PCS. Is there a nutcracker? Is there a mate tunner? And of course, is there any deep venous thrombosis um, or is there a mass, uh, extrinsic mass causing some compression? 
So these are the two arcades that you need to look at. Uh, on the left is a uterine arcade in ovarian reflux, and you'll see it go right across the myometrium at the bottom. That is very typical of a uterine arcade in ovarian venous reflux. On the right side, you see a different pattern of collaterals. These are transpelvic collaterals coming from one internal iliac vein and crossing over to the right internal iliac vein from the left to the right. This is the pattern of pelvic collaterals in iliac venous obstruction. So the left side is a myometrial arcade that you will see in ovarian venous reflux. And on the right side is a transpelvic arcade that you will see in an internal iliac venous reflux from an NIVL. So learn to understand these pictures in the venogram. This is step four of the algorithm. Step five is Ivis guidance. Intravascular ultrasound goes right down to the pelvic brim. You can take it down almost to where the coils are going to put it. it goes, and you can see the Ivis catheter goes down without any problem. This is an 035 um, uh, volcano uh, or Phillips volcano Ivis. Um, and the Ivis is running on the right. And this is the, oops, sorry, sorry. The Ivis is running on the right. And as it's pulled back, you will be able to see various structures. Uh, you can see the uh, ovarian vein. You can see uh, the ovarian vein at various different levels. Remember, measuring the ovarian vein on ultrasound, you may get only one or two levels. You can see the pelvic varicosities there. You will then see yourself entering the renal vein. Uh, you will see yourself coming to the IVC. Uh, you will see a nutcracker. And I'll show you some stills. Um, these are pelvic varices. Uh, right uh, running from uh, three o'clock to nine o'clock position. You can see uh, peri uh, ovarian varices as well around the ovarian vein. Uh, you can actually measure the size of the ovarian vein. This patient's ultrasound size was six mm, but you can see that the size is much bigger than that. Uh, and the patient actually could not be called, had to be plugged and I'll show you the case. Um, this is the size of a normal renal vein. It is nice and well dilated on the left. And on the right side, you can see the typical nutcracker. Uh, at the bottom is the aorta. At the top is the mesenteric artery. And you can see the squashed left renal vein uh, in the aorta mesenteric angle. Uh, this is a typical nutcracker causing left ovarian reflux. Um, it also influences the choice of device, the IVUS. So this is the same patient with the uh, transmyometrial arcade. And on IVUS, we measured this vein to be almost 12 mm in size. So it was too big to coil uh, because you will end up with very large coils that don't seem to work very well. Uh, so we had to put in an ovarian plug. Uh, we had to put in a, a vascular plug. Uh, this is an AVP2 plug uh, that was then required uh, to control uh, the reflux. Of course, um, nowadays, this was done a couple, uh, some time back, and nowadays you have some very good metronic coils um, that can be used even to larger sizes, uh, as well as the penumbra coils uh, that can be used uh, for larger sizes. Uh, you can see that this was an ultrasound study before the embolization, um, pelvic congestion syndrome with left ovarian competency. You need to look for all these things, um, as you can see on the chart on the left. Uh, and this is uh, a post ultrasound scan, a post embolization scan at three months with no reflux and the size of the ovarian vein on the left has now come down to 2.8 millimeters. And this is the pelvic sin congestion syndrome questionnaire. On the left, she had a three by five PCS score and on the right, uh, the PCS score is back to zero in about three months. This is the kind of result uh, you should see in an ovarian vein intervention. Also, you should be aware of patient's life choices. This is a patient who was 24 year old, another patient uh, and who wanted children. There are those who would say it is okay to coil uh, the, the ovarian vein, uh, but I'm a bit uh, um, cautious about doing that uh, in coiling the ovarian vein and sclerosing uh, uh, after that, uh, especially if the patient uh, explicitly states that they plan to have children in the future because the ovarian vein will dilate. Um, and so if the patient wants children and uh, I didn't, she didn't want to take chances, um, uh, we decided therefore that we would proceed um, without any um, embolization and do only form sclerotherapy with balloon control. Please have a look at this uh, CT scan result. The CT scan does not report the presence of ovarian varices. They're often not seen on a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis unless you're specifically looking for a, a, a venous phase with contrast 
you will miss ovarian varices or pelvic varices on a normal CT. So this is her ultrasound scan that shows significant reflux down the left ovarian vein with para, paravaginal and uh, adnexal varices, as well as a tight um, NIVL. Uh, the left side of VAFI has come down to 0.72. As you can see, these are all part of the readings we take uh, before we make a decision. So essentially, this lady needs a left iliac vein stent. Uh, and on the left side, we would like to coil the ovarian vein, uh, but because she wants to have children and she's only 24, we told her we will only do a form sclerotherapy with balloon control, uh, and we'll see how she goes. Um, so uh, this is uh, the right side femoral venogram that looks absolutely normal and then you look at the left side and you will see the typical transpelvic collaterals uh, of an NIVL. Right. Uh, so then this is the same patient's uh, ovarian venogram. Uh, I don't know if it, how well this plays. Yeah, this is the ovarian venogram uh, initially and on the right side you can see that the Fogarty balloon or over the wire Fogarty balloon has been brought in uh, for balloon control because we sclerose uh, with balloon control to make sure uh, that there is no uh, leakage of the dye back into the left renal vein. Uh, and of course, she went ahead and had a left iliac vein stenting as well. The pelvic uh, discomfort settled completely, but it usually takes two or three cycles to settle. Uh, uh, she now has periods of five to six days. Uh, was heavy initially because she was uh, on anticoagulation following the stenting for three months, but that settled down. There's no dyspronia and no post-coital pain. And the description she had was rather graphic of how good sex was. So I won't go down that route in front of this audience. Um, uh, the pelvic congestion syndrome score came down to zero. She had some back discomfort for 10 days or so post-op, which I think was stent related, but that settled. So she, it is of course quite possible that she could have a left-sided coil embolization like this, which is the other option and then a follow-up uh, form sclerotherapy uh, onto the coils itself, uh, which allows you uh, to control it. But she had decided she didn't want it, but this would have been a perfectly acceptable option if she was okay. So I will summarize by saying pelvic congestion syndrome is rather common, but so are the overlap of symptoms. Uh, so a sensitive meticulous history is the key. Be careful, there's a lot of questions to ask about their personal habit and personal life. Make sure you give yourself protection with a, a chaperone around you. Follow this stepwise algorithm with the gynecological assessment actually being the first step. Um, and you must have a full previous gynecological history. Um, a PCS scoring, a transabdominal, transvaginal duplex. And of course, sometimes you might need a lower limb venous duplex as well if you find that there are um, extra anatomical varices present. And the treatment must be tailored for the symptoms and for the patient. Uh, you should not try to treat um, uh, the picture that you see. Uh, you sh your decision on what sort of approach to take, should you intervene or should you inter not intervene, should have been taken long before you decided to do a venogram and an iris. That's the last step. Uh, by this time, decisions to intervene should have been made already. So take your time when you make the assessment uh, and use a stepwise algorithm uh, to get the best results. Thank you. Thank you, Sridham. I will stop my so screen share now. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sridham, very much. And uh, that's what we all want. I think the stepwise algorithm is something that has almost evolved now. I, I, I mean, I'm taking the liberty to make that statement. I mean, you, you're the expert, but you could uh, qualify or modify that. I think uh, that algorithm is almost evolved where now it would be sort of made, it should be made universal in that sense that uh, most of us know that this is your original thinking that you put together or everything put together into one, you've, you've made a synopsis and algorithm. So I think that's that's where you have taken us all. And that's, that's where we are very thankful to you for doing all that and um, uh, making us very well aware of the two major differences. You, you don't you either be the, the iliac vein or the ovarian vein what to do and where to make the difference. That's, that's the key, I think. That's what I want um, to
to emphasize. So uh, if you would uh, sort of go back to what my question was after Dr. Cannon's talk, that Cannon's talk, what is your uh, take on centers that do not have an IVAS? I know IVAS is required, but if they don't have it, what, what, what would you yes. suggest? Yeah, sure. Um, the first thing, of course, um, uh, I will go back to the, um, the original talk that Kanin gave. It was a lovely talk. Um, and uh, 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 the suggestion from the video trial, from Paul Gaines's trial, 50% uh, or 65% stenosis uh, or cross-sectional area, area reduction being a significant stenosis. Um, we are beginning to realize more and more, and Professor Raju has just published a paper on that, uh, that the degree of cross-sectional stenosis does not in any way correlate with the severity of symptoms and BCSS scores um, or the veins quality of life questionnaire. So you could have a 65% stenosis in a perfectly asymptomatic patient, and you could have a 40% cross-sectional area reduction in a significantly symptomatic patient which means to say that you cannot, we cannot make a decision based on ultrasound or IVUS or, um, you know, uh, purely based on the cross-sectional imaging. We cannot make that decision. How can we make a functional assessment of this patient? Um, because the advantage of IVUS is what? The advantage of IVUS is that it allows you to position the stent perfectly. It allows you to size the stent perfectly. It certainly gives you landing zones. If you don't have an IVUS, then you have to assume the longest possible landing zones, uh, which is to say that you will stent patients a little longer than, uh, and uh, not be as cute. Uh, and you will have to try and make the decision on stent sizing um, a little more uh, on a sort of general template of, as he put it, 16 to 18, uh, 14 to 16, uh, that kind of template. Um, and, and put in stent sizing. Of course, the ideal way to do it is to actually measure the diameter of the stent that you require. Um, but if you're not able to do that, you can still get around it with an IVUS. Um, and if you're prepared to do a bilateral wiring, and you should be in most cases, uh, then um, the problem that you have of, of um, laminar flow, so the, the, if you do an, a, a venogram from only one side, um, you will think the confluence is actually uh, a little higher than it, uh, a little lower than it actually is because of the direction of flow. And as it was shown, you can get a one lumbar vertebral body uh, difference. But if you take wires from both sides, you will actually see the wire intersection. Um, uh, and uh, that would be the absolute top end. There's another paper by Gerald O'Sullivan uh, on aiming for the top left corner of the goalposts, uh, which tells you how to aim just to the right, left side uh, of the um, uh, spinal uh, spinous between the spinous process uh, and the and the pedicle of the lumbar vertebra and that should be the top end of your landing zone the bottom end of your landing zone will therefore then have to be uh, down to the external iliac vein if required so if you don't have an ivus you'll have to do these things but ideally you should have an ivus but a decision to do or intervene and stent should be made um, before you go in which is to say your hemodynamic judgment on whether symptoms are bad enough to do something should not be based on what you see on the IVUS. Should I stent or not should not be based on the IVUS. What should I stent and how, how long should I stent should be based on the IVUS. But the decision on whether you should stent or not should have been made before you go in. And that decision now for us is made on two things. Firstly, um, it is symptoms, 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 symptoms. However tight the NIVL, if the patient doesn't have symptoms, you don't stent them. So we've de developed, and we're still working on it, um, a sort of guide known as ABRE. I know ABRE is a stent, but it has nothing to do with the stent. ABRE is an acronym for us. A stands for agony. Um, the patients must have significant enough symptoms for you to require intervention. B stands for BMI. Patients who are obese above 30, and uh, they tend to do much better with stenting. Patients who are less than 21, and uh, I know in many parts of the world, they don't see people with BMI less than 21, but in Singapore, we see a lot of them. Uh, they get a lot of pain after stenting. So we try and avoid patients who are very thin to stent in NIVL, and we have a slightly lower threshold to stent in patients who are fat. Um, so B stands uh, for BMI. R stands for recurrence. 
if you've done multiple superficial vein surgeries in the past and that it keeps coming back, anterior axillary recurs, some lateral veins in the thigh recurs, start thinking of the NIVL being significant. So if you've got, if you get primary varicose veins and see an NIVL, don't stent the NIVL. But if you do the superficial vein surgery as you normally would, and then it recurs and you do it again, and then it recurs again, now you start thinking of the NIVL as being significant. So ABR, E stands for eczema, not just eczema, but skin changes around the ankle. Um, so if there are skin changes, then yes, I will stent an NIVL. Now this is only for NIVL, this is not for post-thrombotic syndrome, that's a different scenario. So we use the sort of ABRE guide, the Arbre guide to decide which NIVL should we take significantly enough to stent or not to stent. So this helps us make a decision on if I see something significant, will I stent? Um, the second thing of course is WAFI. Like I said, a WAFI of less than 0.7 is very, very strongly indicative of a lesion. And after you've stented a patient, the WAFI comes up. Um, and the WAFI, we haven't published it yet, but it will be out in a month and a half or two, um, that the WAFI actually correlates uh, with the VCSS and the Veins Quality of Life Index beautifully. The, the level of WAFI does not correlate with the degree of stenosis. So WAFI's function uh, in terms of correlating with the patient's symptom score seems to be hemodynamically much more significant. Uh, so these two then decide for me, if I see something on an IVIS, will I stent? But the decision of whether I should or should not stent has been made even before I put a, uh, uh, an angiographic needle in the patient. That decision is made before we go in. Does that help? And yeah, yeah it, it, it surely is, is, is a huge help, it, which, uh, uh, as, as I understand it, uh, uh, Sriram, you are trying very hard to convert an art into a science, but there is still this art which by which art I mean the clinical uh, judgment that goes in into making this. So that's uh, otherwise, you know, robots or computers would start treating our patients. And this is where the whole thing comes in that the human being has to be behind this. And when you use your brain, you use your, uh, your history and everything uh, perfectly. And then of course your hands and the Technology. And uh, yes. just a short uh, piece of uh, something I wanted to ask Dr. Kanin. Was that a Boston IVUS you were using? Uh, yes, because in my hospital, I only have the Boston IVUS. Okay. okay, there's something about the Boston IVUS you must remember. And I was noticing that in your pictures and I didn't want to say it. Uh, it's not that one is better than the other. Um, they're, they're two different technologies. Um, the Boston IVUS is essentially one ultrasound camera and it rotates around the wire. And so the wire, the picture, multiple pictures are taken and the computer then puts the segmented picture together. The problem is uh, when you're dealing with small vessels like the coronary, you get fantastic pictures. Uh, and uh, I suspect the rotational IVUS probably has better pictures um, in, in, uh, in the coronary. Uh, but when you start dealing with large vessels like veins uh, and the catheter is rotating around the wire, the wire tends to vi vibrate and you get a lot of wire artifact. So I could see that you were not rotating the wire. You were not rotating your IVUS as you all were going in and out. It was in the same plane. Uh, it's not something you need to do with a, a solid state. Um, so when you're using the Boston IVUS, try and rotate the wire a couple of times. Otherwise uh, you will miss lesions like uh, webs and uh, lateral spurs uh, because they will be falling behind the wire artifact and you won't see it. Uh, it's just a big piece of advice. I could see that <laughs> on your on your IVUS. Uh, the problem with the Philips IVUS, which is a solid state IVUS, is so it doesn't rotate. It's got 64 um, uh, sensors which take pictures, and those 64 pictures in different angles are put together to give you a segmentation. So the um, um, the the resolution of the picture you get uh, is completely restricted by how many cameras there are. Uh, you can't make it, uh, you can't improve the resolution um, uh, from beyond 64. Um, so while you don't get these wire artifacts, um, uh, you may need to do one or two passes of the Philips catheter before you uh, start picking up all lesions. Um, so both have advantages and both have disadvantages, but if you know the technology, then you will be able to get the best out of the two. So again, again I think that's, that's where Sridham is again emphasizing that that's where the art comes in. And uh, we have some questions and uh, 
can I ask uh, Dr. Nathawat and uh, Rahul uh, to one by one after the other take the questions that I see in the group chat? Can you please do that, Dr. Nathawat? Can you start uh, with the questions? Yes, the question from the, the box, all right. Uh, Dr. Kanin, do you perform the duplex ultrasound in supine or standing position for the iliac vein stenosis? Yes, for the stenosis, I tend to do it in supine position. Uh, but for the reflux, we have to uh, stand the patient to see the gravitational effect. So for the respiratory variation and also the flow in the superficial epigastric vein I mentioned, about, I perform it in supine position. Uh, there is a general rule actually that uh, uh, incompetence is better assessed in the standing position uh, and uh, assessments for obstruction are better done in the supine position. Um, uh, because uh, the emphasis, it's very difficult to show a Valsalva difference uh, in the standing position. Um, uh, you already have the reflux you need. So you, uh, you have an anti-grade versus retrograde. But the nice thing when you're looking at pelvis and you're looking at the iliac veins uh, and you're trying to induce um, you know, retrograde flows with Valsalva, et cetera, it, it is far more sensitive in the supine position. So yeah, I agree with Dr. Kanin. Yeah, another question is how to make sure the good inflow before standing? How to make sure? Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, well, normally I, we have to evaluate the femoral vein and also the profunda vein, and we need at least one to uh, to be functioning to get a little bit of the inflow. Otherwise, we would be, we would have the thrombus stent, and we prefer both to be open. So we have to measure something or not, like the blood flow or just prevent the, the, the flow is okay or not? Uh, normally, I think it's a little bit difficult to measure the blood flow. As uh, Dr. Siram said, if you have the obstruction upward, even you have the normal veins, I would think the flow would be decreased anyway. So I think it's difficult for uh, to measure the blood flow if we don't correct the obstruction, mm -hmm. obstruction first. Uh, the the approach for me comes back again. Sorry, Rahul, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just ask a question on this only. Uh, you can you know combine your answer on that. Will it make a difference if you uh, measure the baseline velocities in the common femoral vein, or you know the profunda vein you're going to land up, and then augment it at the same time and measure the velocities after that, and if there is a good augmentation, uh, that means because the collaterals are taking the blood up anyway, then I feel that you know would be a very uh, simple. You know, one you need a landing zone, and second is you can see how good the inflow will be. I don't know. Uh, is there any scientific paper uh, published on that? Um, okay, in terms of uh, profunda and common femoral vein uh, confluence and augmentation of that, there are a few things. Firstly, um, you have to see if the profunda has been quite, obviously this conversation is happening on a background of post-thrombotic syndrome, not in a background of, of non-thrombotic ileic vein lesions. Um, so already by definition for me, you are looking at a, a femoral vein puncture or a popliteal vein puncture. Uh, you're not looking at a groin puncture to make the assessment and therefore you must be imaging the whole femoral vein. Um, uh, and so the second thing that you need to do on the ultrasound, as you say, if there is coaxial transformation of the profunda and you can show augmentation at the profunda common femoral junction, then yes, there may be a good reason to think that you have adequate inflow. On the other hand, if the origin of the profunda gets involved in the post-thrombotic process, which means uh, that you have hardly any femoral vein that is normal, uh, then you're unlikely to show that profunda femoral junction augmentation because the, coax, the profunda will not undergo coaxial transformation if its ostium is blocked. It cannot undergo that transformation. So I suspect, although I don't know of many publications and I certainly don't know if there are any specific parameters of how much the augmentation should be, 
and what should be the change in the spectral Doppler waveform, et cetera. I don't think that's been done. But in theory, if the profunda ostium is involved, it means your inflow is not good enough. And you should be able to see the presence or absence of augmentation. Um, coming back, of course, to the femoral puncture, the answer for me is very simple. Um, you iris the whole system. Uh, you can see you can see the the presence or absence of of um, uh, the ability of the uh, femoral vein to respond to valsalva under ivus. You will actually see the femoral vein distend. Uh, you will see if there are fibrotic changes in the vein wall. You will see if there are any synechia in the common femoral or the femoral vein. Uh, you will know what is the length of the inflow you have. Uh, you will know all this under ivus. Uh, so yeah, my decision on is the inflow good enough uh, will be based on ivus ring. And I'll take the last question uh, because it's uh, pertain to India. Uh, you know, so when IVUS has got so many advantages, so why we are not using it and uh, more in India? And how much does an IVUS system cost? And um, you know, I can answer that question. Uh, you know, we are using the IVUS. Uh, not many centers are using it because if you look into the uh, you know the cost uh, effectivity, so most of the good center also are not doing more than six to eight cases a month, you know? And, you know, that is also a big number. If you really select the people uh, according to the symptoms and not according to the MR blocked images, then your number will really fall further low. And then the cost effectivity is does not come out because the IVA system in India, you know, Phillips or Boston, will cost you somewhere around 45 to 5 lakhs, depending upon the institute. And one IVUS costs somewhere around, you know, uh, very, the, the catheter varies from 60 to 80,000 rupees. So, uh, you know, that's that's the problem. So, you know, the cost effectivity. So the centers who are using the IVUS is where the coronary IVUS is being used. So then it makes a sense because the coronary people, they are using IVUS quite a lot now, and especially for instant respinosis. And so, you know, complex lesions, landing zones, so there, you don't have to pay for the machine. So you just have to pay for the fiber. So that's why definitely if your center has the IVUS machine, you should use it. And uh, definitely there are a lot of advantages. Yeah, but there is a disadvantage uh, of, of combining yeah. with cardiac guys, you know. Uh, the disadvantage is the cardiac guys by nature will buy a coronary IVUS. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, the Boston does give you better pictures for it. Uh, uh, but the biggest Boston catheter is an 014 catheter. Uh, there is an 018 that has uh, been talked about, but I've never seen it. And the 0035 catheter is, is somewhere in the ether. It's, so the problem with an 014 uh, catheter is that your diameter of visualization is about 20 millimeters, two centimeters. And that's okay when you're in the femoral iliac vein. Uh, but once you enter the IVC or you're at the iliac cable confluence, uh, you don't see the aorta. Uh, you don't see vessels on either side. You're not going to see a lumbar osteophyte pressing in from the outside. Uh, you don't see these things. Um, so you don't have the range of visualization. The advantage of a, a 035 um, volcano catheter uh, is that you have a 60 millimeter uh, diameter, so six centimeters of vision. Um, so if, but your cardi but you, your cardiologist can buy a volcano system and they can do their cardiac with it and you can use the same system uh, for the veins. Yeah. Uh, the problem is the cardiac guys don't really like volcano that much because their images are better with the with the Boston 014. Um, so there's always a bit of conflict in this, um, and I'm hoping somebody will come up. Either Philips will make a great 014 uh, or Boston will make a great 035. Uh, and this problem will be solved once and for all. Uh, but at the moment, that's the conflict. Shiram, another point I want to make. Uh, I just um, uh, maybe misunderstood. You mentioned that you will not embolize the ovarian veins so that the patient does not have an effect on the pregnancy. What yes, is? I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm reluctant to do it. I, I'm, I'm reluctant I am, to do it, and there are people I, who I, do. I, I, uh, the only published paper on it is from the Whiteley Clinic, uh, where they have published on pregnancy post embolization, um, and they have eight cases uh, in that publication, um, and that has gone just fine. There's never been a problem. Okay, so I agree. I agree that you can embolize and you can sclerose on the way out with a balloon controlled sclerosin, 
and you're unlikely to get coil embolization, which is the supposed fear of coiling someone who goes on to get pregnant. Uh, I have also called a patient who has then by accident gone on to become pregnant at 41. Um, and uh, yes, I will agree that nothing really went wrong, although um, I was uh, as worried as the, the father of the child um, during this whole pregnancy that she had, uh, but I was very worried. I suspect my opinion is a little colored and my opinion is colored by the fact that uh, in my early days of training, I have actually seen a coil in the right atrium. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, you need to have, we didn't, you know, it was done in our unit in the UK. Um, and uh, if you've seen it once, it sort of uh, scars you for life. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm reluctant. Uh, I offer it to the patients. And if they choose that they're okay with it, if the pain is so bad, then I will coil. Mm -hmm. And I will try and coil as far down as possible. But this is, uh, this is opinion. They, this is not, that if you look at published evidence, then what you say is right, Raul that you can actually uh, coil embolize the patient and sclerose the patient uh, on the way out. Um, and the, the published evidence says that that is perfectly all right. It doesn't create much trouble. No, no, Shirna, why am I asking you this question? You know, we had this discussion last time also, you remember that. Mm -hmm. And after that, I went off and uh, searched for the literature. Actually, I didn't knew the population, but I was doing the coil embolization and people have become pregnant in the last 16, 17 years. That the pregnancy wasn't your fault, of course. No, no, of course not. And uh, the, the reason is because then I looked into it, there are more than eight to nine publications which are published there in the uh, from 2015, 16, 19 publications. And you know, more than uh, all the studies have got around 12 to 18 patients included in the studies. And so all the studies have shown that actually talking, you can do the coil embolization. And the patient had a successful pregnancy, and they did not find any, you know, complications. So that's why, you know, I thought. Yes, I agree with you. I agree. The, like I said, the published data says that it's okay. Yeah, yeah. That is the published data. Mm -hmm. This is opinion, and this opinion, I'm honest enough to say, is colored by uh, mm -hmm. experience from the past. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, the published data does say that if you coil, then they can go ahead and get pregnant. But I, I have this discussion with my patients anyway. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they can yeah, the but I'll, uh, mic it to you. It's uh, 709. So I'll give the mic to you. Okay. The, I, I'll just I'll just take the last question. I think it's important. If there is reflux in superficial saphenous vein in a patient with C6, would you ablate the saphenous vein or prefer to exclude an iliac vein stenosis? So to the speakers, panelists, anybody, but I think the speakers have the first go at that. In my practice, I tend to correct the obstruction first. Um, but you can either do the obstruction alone first and see if the patient gets, uh, the patients get better, the wound healing, or you can have the option to correct the obstruction and simultaneously do uh, the ablate, the reflux vein. But I think for my practice, you need something to do with the obstruction. Sridham, what's your take on that? Uh, I used to do what the Dr. Kanin does, which is I would I I would I was very enthusiastic stenter, as you know. Uh, so I would stent and then do the ablation if required. And then I went through a phase when I would both stent and ablate at the same time. Um, but now, like I said, I've uh, realized that uh, the, the results aren't that hot. Um, uh, the, I've moved to this Arbery kind of algorithm where the R is recurrent. So at this point, I will be conscious of the fact that there is an NIVL. I will let the patient know that recurrence is a chance. But at the moment, I'm doing the superficial um, venous uh, first. However, um, if the recurrence is either early or immediately after you do the superficial ablation, the ulcer doesn't heal because this is a C6 patient, or you find that there is a new onset limb swelling after you've ablated the superficial vein, uh, then you're going to have to go back and stent. So um, I don't know. I really don't know what the right order of uh, sequence is because I have followed all three orders now uh, over time, and um, uh, I'm not quite sure what it is, perhaps we need to do a hemodynamic assessment um, in some way and see is 
the, uh, is that NIVL really that hemodynamically significant? And I think we're getting to that now. Um, and if it is significant, then it makes perfect sense to do the NIVL as well as the superficial vein at the same time. Um, on the other hand, if the NIVL is not significant, I suppose you could do the superficial ablation and see. Okay, I think uh, in, in situations where cost is definitely a consideration, there is a tendency to let the economics decide what to do first. And I think this is, this is where situations for most of the private practitioners or the public system comes in and that you would treat with compression, superficial venous reflux elimination, and then go with that. I think that would be the sequence when economics decide or when insurance companies are deciding. But there's also happens. another issue, Malay, is that yeah. venous, venous stenting is an implant. It's not just cost. And it's not an implant that is without complications. Stents thrombose, stents re stents fracture. Absolutely. Um, uh, as I, you know, I, I used to do, yeah, I had a clue. I used to do a lot of deep venous, open deep venous reconstruction surgery, as you all are aware. Uh, and now the only deep, open deep venous reconstruction surgery predominantly that I do is stents that can't be recanalized. I'm not doing femoral cable bypasses because there's nothing you can do uh, for the occluded stent. Um, so, you know, most of the open surgery for deep venous now, for me at least, is related to stent complications that can't be salvaged anymore. Um, we are so I, you know, what has happened is in the last six years, we have totally changed. We used to do so much eyelid stents. And now, actually, we, we are doing one eyelid stent in two months. The number has gone so down. And what we have also observed, there are two very important things we have observed is loss of weight mm. and extensive physio. Really, oh, physiotherapy. Yes. Most of the patient's symptoms, really, they just disappear. Amazing. You try this. I have, you know, we have been very aggressive with this from the last six years. You'll be amazed the how much the patient's symptoms disappear. Improve and I, the weight because, loss. You know, really, the loss of weight, very, very specific and extensive physiotherapy. And, you know, a lot of these patients, you know, uh, ankle movements, a lot of ankle movements, so the skin becomes very soft. Applications of moisturizer. Uh, it, it's amazing. It, you get the similar results uh, in the long term, what we have been observing. And you don't have to put the patients on anticoagulation. So you don't have a problem with the you know, thrombosis of the stents. And, you know, all this idea came in because few years back when we were putting in the stents, patients had a blocked stent, but patient did not come to mind. So they had a test for something else. And then they found the stent has already recluded, but the patient did not have a recurrent symptoms. You know, I just thought that really did this patient required to be stented and we started shifting slowly to the conservative treatments. So, you know, what you're saying, you know, really fits into our practice from last six years. I, so I, I think some of us have learned by burning our fingers hmm. from uh, not stenting anybody to stenting anything that moved or walked or didn't even have legs, we would stent them. Uh, and then uh, learning, learning to be uh, a lot more circumspect. Uh, yes. so the the, the, the post-traumatic syndrome is a different cup of tea altogether. I, I have yes. a very low threshold to stand there. Um, but the NIVL, I've become very circumspect about who needs to be stent. So I think, I think you know, Sriram, you may be knowing the phrase that we, as we say in India, you know, my hair didn't turn gray in the sun. They turned gray by wisdom. So my hair fell off. Oh, because of the mistakes I made. <laughs> because, of, because I'm dealing with the health complications, some of which I've created myself. So I'm aware yeah. of what they are. So, so I think uh, there's one more question. Do we, is, is it okay if we just take it and consider that as the last question? Okay. And, uh, and then call that. So uh, there's a post iliac vein stent stenosis. What's your solution? Redilate surgery or a covered stent. Now, I think Sriram, you admitted to the fact that you, you have a few occlusions. So you, you're the best person to say uh, that. Yeah, this is not stent uh, occlusion. This is stent stenosis. Um, the truth is that instant re-stenosis in an iliac vein stent is very different from ISR in an arterial stent. An arterial stent ISR is essentially endothelial hyperplasia. So there is a um, uh, ingrowth of multiple layers of endothelium and that covers the bare metal stent. 
And so you try and deal with that with the covered stent because then all you get is the toffee wrapper kind of stenosis at either end. And you can use drug coated balloons and all that to prevent it and stuff. In veins, veins do not undergo endothelial hyperplasia. Veins undergo medial hyperplasia when they are stented. So the multiple in layers that you see as instant restenosis in a venous stent is essentially organized thrombus. Uh, it is not layers of endothelium. Histologically, it is organized thrombus. So if you're having an instant restenosis developing, my suggestion to you is to do a very determined and firm redilatation of the stent, um, try and destroy as much thrombus as you can and anticoagulate the patient for a while. Um, if you've done a three month anticoagulation, you might need to do a two year anticoagulation. Um, if it is still keeps on restenosing, then there might be a technical problem with the stent, look for a, in, uh, for a stent fracture or something that's causing the instant to keep coming back. Uh, but so that, and that, that, that brings me to the final question is, would you use a cutting balloon in that? Because the, you, you know yeah. that they're organized. Okay. Yeah. Fine. The, pur the purpose of the cutting balloon is to, is to cut a fibrotic area that is non-compliant part of the venous wall and uh, convert the non-compliant area of the venous wall to compliant part. So in a chronic fibrotic vein. Once the, uh, the stent is already in place, uh, the cutting balloon is doing very little in its place. I would use a, a, a non-compliant high pressure balloon, uh, you know, which is what we use in veins most of the time anyway, um, and uh, redilate the stent as much as possible. Make sure the aspect ratio comes as close to one as you can, which is the maximum diameter and the minimum diameter ratio. It should come pretty much, it should be a, a circle again. Um, and then anticoagulate. Uh, of course, if the stent occludes, that's a different story. You're gonna have to try and open it up and reline it if you Thank you. Thank you. No, no covered stents in the venous system. No. Right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kampol, for being the convener along with us and Nata Wat and uh, being a panelist and Dr. Wuchai and then Dr. Kanan and Sriram for being excellent speakers. I think this is a topic that I, you know, though it attracts less number of people as far as the talks are concerned, I think it is the area where we are now seeing the art being converted to a science and we are learning more and more as time goes by and this is, I think, still the next frontier that needs to be taken over. Thank you and thank you, Prof. Kampol. Thank Thanks, Kanin. Thank you, Nutwat. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank well, you. we'll we'll see you. we'll we'll see you, Sridham and Kanin, when you when you, when you have more wisdom and when you have converted more of the art into the science. So let's see. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.